If you like this video, please consider supporting the Otokana channel over on Patreon. Thank you. Welcome to episode four of the Color Theory series. I hope you're enjoying the series so far. In this episode, we are going to talk about the first part of how to avoid making mud. There are two components to us avoiding mud or making mud. The first is in using complementary colors, which are the colors that are opposite in the color wheel. The second is mixing up color temperatures. We covered the color temperatures a little bit in the split primary palette, but we'll go into more detail of that in the next episode. For this episode though, we are going to focus on color mixing with complementary colors. As I said, complementary colors are colors that are directly opposite each other on the color wheel. So say this one and this one, the A pair, is a complementary color to each other, and then the B pairs are complementary to each other, and so on and so forth. So we have six pairs of complementary colors in this 12 color wheel palette. In color schemes, complementary colors get talked about a lot because complementary colors make the most vivid pair of colors. And that's because the two colors in a complementary pair are the most different from each other in the color world because they are opposite each other. So like we covered in the warm color, cool color video, which are these pairs, the hottest color and the coolest color are a pair. And that's where we probably heard a lot about complementary colors. However, complementary colors are incredibly useful in color mixing as well. Because the magic of complementary colors is that, yes, they are most vibrant when they're next to each other, but also when you mix them, they become the most muted colors you can get on the palette. Let me show you what I mean. So here we have the A pair, the whatever color you have in your A well and your color that is in your bracket A well. And these two are complementary colors. So we take a little bit of the A color. You won't need as much of the yellow as your ultramarine violet. Just put some to the side and then take your opposite color, the A bracket, and take a good portion of this color because you're gonna need more of this than the yellow. So if we mix these two, it's gonna start graying out. And when you get the balance right, you should get to a perfectly grayed out or as grayed out gray as you can get. Let's give it a try. So that's a really good grayed out color. So when you mix the complementary colors in a good balance, you get this perfectly grayed out color. And that is true with all six of the complementary pairs. So the A pairs mute each other out, the B pairs mute each other out, C pairs mute each other out, Ds, Es and Fs also mute each other out. If we then add a little bit of violet to that, it starts turning a little bit more bluish color, like this. That is of a little bit of a cooler gray because the ultramarine violet is a cooler color than the permanent yellow deep. Let's add some more. You get more bluey as you add the ultramarine violet. And this exercise, I do recommend you do at home as well, rather than just watching it, because this is such a critical part of knowing how to mix colors. And you will learn a lot more from doing it yourself. So we're almost back to the ultramarine violet. Let's now go back to the middle. And then we go this way by adding more yellow. You'll find that you'll need a lot less yellow than 
the violet to get a difference in hue. There we go. As you can see, when you mix the two complementary colors, it will gray out really nicely. And I'm going to show you that this will work for all your six pairs. This is the B pair. So that is these two pairs. For me, it was permanent yellow orange with ultramarine finest. And this grays out nicely here. And you get this really nice range of dark yellow oranges and dark ultramarine violets. Then you get the C pairs, which for me is vermilion hue with phthalo blue yellow shade. And again, they mute each other out nicely. And then the D pair, which is the Scarlet Lake and the Thalo Turquoise. Now, with the different pairs, you get different kinds of greys, and this provides you with the strongest, darkest muted colour. And that's because these two have the highest tinting strength. It, they are such strong colours that when you create its muted colour, it's really nice and strong. In comparison, this is the a pair that we just did and you can really see the difference in value this is much darker muted color than this one then we have the e pair with the quinacridone rose and the thalo green and this one can tend slightly to a more inky gray than something like the a pair and then finally we have the f pair with the quinacridone violet and the may green Depending on the colors you've chosen for each pair, you are gonna get slightly different results. So sometimes you may want to choose a different color because you don't quite like the muted color that it creates. For example, I'm not the biggest fan of the muted colors that the E pair and the F pair creates. These ones are not quite gray enough for my liking. And so in my own personal palette, after I finished studying color theories, what I did was I did a lot of tests combining all the greens I had with the Conacodon Rose. And I discovered that I personally like a hooker's green instead of phthalo green as the E pair complement. It comes to a much more, what I would call a grayer, more well muted color. And then I discovered that the hooker's green is perfect also for cancelling out the quinacridone violet into a shade of grey that I really liked. And I have to admit, I'm not the biggest fan of Taylor green or May green. I much preferred hooker's green to these two greens. I never ever used these two in my real life painting. So what I did in my studio palette is I replaced both the E and F the thalo green and the may green with hooker's green and i just labeled it as e and f so i know that when i want to cancel out an e or an f color i can just use the hooker's green but that comes later on but i will go over this again in a video that i'm going to make later on about all the customization you can do to make this palette be practical for your own creative pursuits so that's ha what happens when you mix complementary colors. As I said before, to be able to avoid mud, you need to know how to make it so that you can know exactly what to avoid. So if you want to mix bright colors and you don't want to be creating muted colors, you know that from doing this, that you want to avoid mixing the complementary colors. Also, if you really, really want to avoid muted colors in general, I would also avoid the colors that are on either side of the complementary color. So if I'm mixing this color, I would generally avoid mixing it with its complementary and the colors on either side. You tend to gonna get muted colors because these two colors have really strong elements of this color as well. And vice versa, if you're mixing this color, avoid mixing with these three colors. So that's how to avoid graying out your color. But I do have to make a confession. When I was learning color theory, I have to admit the complementary color mixing, the how to make gray on purpose was the most boring part 
of learning color theory. And that was because I was really, really interested in all these bright, lovely, yummy colors. Who cares about grays? I'm never going to use the grays. I'm never going to use boring colors like muted colors. However, when I came to apply color theory to real life paintings, I found that the ability to mute colors down was the single most important and useful and most frequently used trick I used. So let's talk about why I found personally this trick of being able to mix complementary colors to tone the color down was so useful. First off, when you paint things, things are gonna have shadows. For example, there's a shadow right here, there's a shadow right here, and there's also shadows in the swells. Now, if you don't paint the shadows, things are gonna look really, really flat, or you get this weird thing of the object you've painted looking like it's floating in midair. You also lose all three dimensionality, so this would just look like a flat thing rather than a dish with really interesting shapes happening. And the way you express these shapes are with shadows, which are colors that are muted down. Some people do have in their palette, most commonly an ultramarine and a burnt umber, to be able to create a neutral tone that they can add to whatever color they're mixing, or they might have a neutral tint in their color. And that's okay, but as you saw in these color mixing charts, each color has a different kind of neutral tone to them. They're not all the same. So a red thing might mute itself in a different way to a yellow object. And if you just use one neutral color to do that, then you don't get that variance. You don't get the richness of what's happening here. And I wanna be clear that I'm not against people just using the ultramarine and burnt umber pair to mute other colors. I'm also not against people using neutral tint instead of muting the colors out. I think they are really, really good shortcuts to getting what you want. And there are so many watercolor masters that I can't even list in this video because this video would be incredibly long that uses neutral tint or the burnt umber and ultramarine pair. But this series is about color theories and you have this palette and hopefully you'll be basing your palette around the color wheel. So you have this function available to you that you can mute colors so nicely and in very flexible, very expressive ways that you might as well use it. The other very important reason why you need a gray in your painting, especially if you're into bright colors and creating really vibrant bright color is this. To make the vibrant colors sing in your painting, you're gonna need to add some neutral colors because what makes bright colors really shine is that contrast of it being next to a neutral color. I'm gonna show you. So let's say you have a painting that is mostly of EF and A. So I'm gonna try and make them as close to each other as possible. Let's get more water in. I'm just gonna do a quick abstract and some ultramarine violet and some quinacridone violet. Now I'm gonna leave this one as it is, but on this one, I'm gonna drop in some complementary color to create a muted color on top of this. Because I used the quinacridone rose, I'm gonna stick some thalo green, which is its complement, just in places and just smush it around so some of it will get muted out. Now, if I do this, 
and just let you focus on this. I mean, this is a pretty vibrant color, but it also feels a little bit flat, right? And then I'm going to show you this. Yes, it has darker parts, but the colors you can see in between are so much more vibrant and it looks so much more three dimensional. And the reason why that is, is because this one is just all vibrant. The saturation, which is how bright a color is of the painting is pretty similar. There's a little bit of difference happening where the colors have pulled, but there's a lot more variance in saturation happening here. And because they are darker bits, it kind of pushes the same colors higher up on how bright it looks on the painting. And so if you've just thrown a lot of bright colors in your painting and it kind of looks flat and it's not as vibrant as you had hoped using all these vibrant colors would, then I highly recommend throwing in some muted colors or its complement colors so that you're going to be creating some muted tones in there to create that contrast in saturation. So that was complementary colors. Complementary colors are incredibly useful for creating shadows in your paintings, which, I mean, you can't really paint any object or person without having shadows. And it's also a great way to make your bright colors be more bright and shine in your paintings. Grays seem quite boring, especially if you're into bright colors, but they will become your best friend the more you paint. I hope you now feel comfortable in creating greys. I do highly recommend doing this diagram for all the six pairs of colors you have so that you can see what kind of neutrals you get from your palette because it will be different depending on, on what brand and what colors you've gone for. And if you don't like the neutral colors that your palette creates, you are free to have a play, have a lot of mixing session to see which one you do like because what's most important is you use the colors and the colors that will create the effect for you that you want i do have a little caveat though is that i do recommend sticking to the 12 colors of the color wheel that represents each square for now while you learn color theory because we're going to be using this to learn lots of other things first and then you can adapt and change your 12 color palette as you like once you start taking it into your studio palette and using it for real life paintings. So I hope this video was interesting to you. If it was, please do give it a thumbs up. Thank you so much for watching this video and I will see you in the next video where I will talk about part two of how to avoid making mud. So I will see you in that video. Bye.